Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. Welcome back to the show. Before I get started, allow me a moment to give thanks to the Society for Historians of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a sponsor of the show. The Society is the primary professional association for historians of this period and they publish an exceptional journal called The Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. If you like this show, you'll love the journal, and you might want to consider joining the Society. You can find out more on shagape.org. That's S-H-G-A-P-E dot O-R-G. Now for today's episode. Today we're doing a feed drop from the Brattleboro Literary Festival Cocktail Hour, which is a fun and informal monthly event which features me and Ed O'Keefe, who is the CEO of the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library. This was recorded on Friday, May 17th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. It was a live event with questions, but I think it'll be really interesting to the listeners of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era podcast, so I am putting it on here. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Everyone's been off traveling, but now it's nearly summer here in Vermont, and it's all about the garden. We're here this evening with author Edward O'Keefe, author of a brand new book, The Loves of Theodore Roosevelt, The Women Who Created a President. He is in conversation with historian and author Michael Cullinane. Theodore Roosevelt wrote his senior thesis for Harvard in 1880 that women ought to be paid equal to men and had the option of keeping their maiden names upon marriage. It's little surprise given the influence of his mother, two of his sisters, and his two wives, that he went on to become a feminist. Teddy Roosevelt had quite a history in Vermont. The chat is open, and the Q&A for the author questions. Also, the event is closed captioned. You can enable it on your screen. Edward F. O'Keefe is the CEO of the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library Foundation. He previously spent two decades in broadcast and digital media, during which time he received a Primetime Emmy Award for his work with Anthony Bourdain, two Webby Awards, the Edward R. Murrow Award, and the George Foster Peabody Award for ABC News coverage on 9-11. A former fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, he was graduated with honors from Georgetown, and he was born in North Dakota and lives in New York with his wife and son and daughter. Michael Cullinane is a historian of American politics, an award-winning author, and the Loman Walton Chair of Theodore Roosevelt Studies at Dickinson State University. He also serves as a public historian for the Theodore Roosevelt Association and contributes to the design and curation of the Theodore Roosevelt Library, which is due to open in 2026 on America's 250th anniversary. He is the author of several books and hosts the popular podcast, The Gilded Age and Progressive Era. Welcome, Edward and Michael. Thanks, Sandy. Wonderful to be with you. I've been looking forward to this conversation, Mike. This is going to be tons of fun, uh, Ed. And um, for those in the audience, um, let's just say we know each other. Um, I'm I'm very fond of your work, as as you're well aware. And um and and you've been an absolute uh, gentleman to talk to about about this book. Uh, I'm so excited to delve into it, but I think actually I want to just give you a moment to reflect maybe a little bit about why you decided to write this book, and then let's get into the women and the personalities here. But what made you decide to write this? Sure. Well, I grew up in North Dakota, as Sandy mentioned, and when you grow up in North Dakota, you do suffer a surfeit of heroes. Uh, You know, we've got Peggy Lee and Lawrence Welk, maybe Roger Maris or Phil Jackson, but Theodore Roosevelt, uh, it it takes the cake. I mean, I I may I would like to say I chose Theodore Roosevelt, but I think Theodore Roosevelt chose me. Uh, I was I've been fascinated by his story and in particular his time in the West and the Badlands of North Dakota my whole life. Uh, I was a Red River Rough Rider. Uh, That was my high school. And I always thought, you know, I wanted to have the time to research and write about TR and with 20 years in media, never did. 
Uh, and when I was an entrepreneurship fellow at Harvard, I finally had the time to look into the archive, to dive into that incredible collection. Was very fortunate that over that time, um, authors like you had begun to produce works that uh, remembering Theodore Roosevelt gathering those those incredible oral interviews and and I you know finally had the opportunity to act on my life's passion and and put this book the loves of Theodore Roosevelt together. Well, and it's it makes a major contribution to our understanding of his life because uh, I mean I don't think I'm saying this I'm not saying this with my tongue in cheek at all. He is one of the most macho characters in American history. And what you've staked out here is that Theodore Roosevelt was actually a feminist. And so tell us how you come to that conclusion. Well, it's an unexpected turn, right? The loves of Theodore Roosevelt argues that perhaps the most masculine president in the American memory was actually the product of women. And I think it really goes to these unsung and extraordinary uh, people, these women in his life, who, who've always been characters in the story, but never the central character. You know, Mitty, his mother, is really written off in history as inconsequential in her contribution, but yet she is the source of his vivacious personality. She has these coy turns of phrase, these witty aphorisms, and she is the one who really teaches him that to live for the living and not for the dead. I mean, so two of Theodore Roosevelt's most characteristic, um, uh, you know, understandings, right? His this his resilience and will through pain and the inevitable suffering of life and this um, charismatic personality and wit. Um, you know, his two sisters, Bammy and Connie, serve very different purposes in his life, but they're there for every strategic move and decision that he makes. And then, of course, his wives, um, Alice and Edith, Alice, similar to Mitty, largely written off in history as inconsequential. But the research that I did and the, and the work that I show in The Loves of Theodore Roosevelt makes, uh, I hope, a very compelling case that she was there with him during some of his most consequential moments and would have continued to be with him had she lived. And of course, e Edith, I mean, you know, more books should be written about Edith because she is undoubtedly the first modern first lady. So it's an unexpected story, but it was always there, hiding in plain sight, I hope waiting to, to be told and brought out into the light. Well, let, I think that's a great way to start it off. You've, you've laid out the five uh, women here in his life, but let's start with Mitty, because when I first read your book, the first thing that I took away from it was about Mitty. She has been written off by historians in the past, Maybe in part because Theodore Roosevelt's father is such a looming presence. I mean, when you walk into Sagamore Hill in New York, there's Theodore Roosevelt's father's portrait, almost like looming over the entire space. But what you point out in your book is that, well, tell us about her condition, her, her mental health, her state of mind, and then tell us how that is just completely permeated the historical accounts of, of her life. Well, I mean, you know, she's... Uh she has been written off as really the stereotypical Victorian woman who takes to the fainting couch, who, uh, you know, who resigns herself from um, the, the society and public life of her family. And these things are just simply not true. I, I mean, she, one, she's a, a dionist of society. She holds a very influential salons. Uh, she holds lots of public conversation. But really, in her private life, I mean, I, I think you've hit the, the nail on the head, Michael, you know, that the Theodore Roosevelt's father takes such a, a, a large place and that pedestal is held for him. And, and maybe rightfully so. Right. He he is the co-founder of the American Museum of Natural History. He is the founder of the first orthopedic hospital in New York. He is one of the founders of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You know, he's he's a wonderful philanthropic spirit. And then, of course, he'll die when TR is 20 years old. So whatever light he held him to was even exalted further because he was gone too soon from Theodore's life. But Mitty is the one who's home. You know, Mitty is raised in the South. She comes after the marriage uh, to Thee to the North. When the Civil War is breaking out, her mother and her sister will join the Roosevelt. So think of this, you know, Theodore Roosevelt is growing up with two sisters, his mother, his grandmother, and his aunt in the home. I mean, he is he is surrounded by women. And, and, and Mitty, you know, she 
she is the one who introduces the McGuffey readers along with Aunt Anna to the homeschooled children, the Roosevelts. That's where he's reading the African proverb, speak softly and carry a big stick, right? N nervous Nellies and all these different uh, phrases that he'll use throughout his life to, to connect with people. And she's the one from whom he learns empathy, how to make connection with people. I mean, you know, she is literally massaging his chest to get the blood to come out during asthmatic attacks. Thee is blowing cigar smoke in his face and, and taking him on midnight rides, which is not a great way to, to help try to ease um, asthma. You know, so, and then you have this kind of interesting turn, right? Thee at around 12, 10, 12 years old says to his son, you have the mind, but not the body. If you want your mind to go further, you must make your body. That's, a, you know, adolescence. That's about the time that, you know, Theodore is rejecting his mother and her kind of approach to life, the salubrious air of the, um, the health spa and, and the ways in which he probably felt the need for her in his young childhood but rejected as he became older and into adolescence. And then, as I mentioned, you know, his father dying just took, displaced, I think, um, Mitty from her central point in the story. And, and the last thing I'll say, Mike, on this point is just, I had this amazing conversation with Betty Caroli, who wrote uh, the Roosevelt Women, vignettes of both the Hyde Park line and the Oyster Bay line of Roosevelt's. And, and goes down through the descendants, not just uh, the primary family. And Betty really believes, and I expound in The Loves of Theodore Roosevelt on the idea that Mitty intentionally withdrew herself from the Roosevelt family competition, that she wanted Bammy and Connie, her daughters, to be confident and succeed. And if this beautiful, lively, intelligent mother overshadowed them, they might not be the, the leaders that they later became. And I just found that a fascinating kind of second look at how Mitty approached uh, life, and in particular, her daughters, Bammy and Connie, who would be so consequential in Theodore Roosevelt's life. That's great. I, I, hadn't, um, I hadn't even thought about that before. I think the other thing that you talk about with Mitty and Thee Thee comes ac across much sterner in your book than previous accounts. And I, I have to agree entirely with you. I think it's from everything that I've read, um, he's not just a warm, fuzzy character in the story of Theodore Roosevelt. He's a stern dad and she is a much more vibrant figure too. So um, I just want to uh, move on to the sisters because you mentioned them and these are two wonderful personalities. So Anna Roosevelt, better known as Bammy, we were talking before about how we have to get all the names straight, not just the names, but the nicknames as well. So Anna is the oldest. Her nickname is Bammy. Then the the youngest daughter in the, the house is Corrine. It looks like Corinne, but it's pronounced Corrine. And, and it, her nickname is Connie. So let's just start with Bammy because she is a larger than life figure. She lives until 1931. She's really a remarkable woman. Please tell us about Bammy. Well, let's just start with the fact that it's a Alice Roosevelt Longworth, who will later say that had Bammy been a man, she, not Theodore Roosevelt, would have been president of the United States. And thanks to your good work in, uh, in, in the collecting of the Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, the oral interviews, we know that Eleanor Roosevelt agreed with that assessment. So none other than Eleanor Roosevelt felt that Bammy uh, would have been president had she been a man. Uh, Bammy is only three years older than TR, uh, but those three years make a big difference. She is the older sister and she's almost a substitute mother for, for Theodore. You know, she, um, she's, she is, suf she suffers a, a, a spinal defect. And so serious is that spinal defect that her grandmother observes that Bammy cannot stand for more than 30 seconds before a countenance of pain overcomes her. She winces and crumbles to the ground. And yet she persists as she will do throughout her life. So again, it is from Bammy, his older sister, that Theodore is learning to will his way through pain. He sees that example in Bammy. 
But Bammy will become, I mean, she's she's the one who moves Theodore into his college dorm, uh, his college apartment. She's the one who decorates that apartment. She'll later be the one who introduces him to Richard Harding Davis, who will cover him as a police commissioner and later in his exploits in Cuba and make him a hero of that war. She's the one who uh, you know, arranges and suggests the meeting that will lead to him becoming assistant secretary of the Navy, one of the most critical moments in his political ascendancy. Uh, she has a home in Washington, D.C., on N Street, 10 minutes from the White House, known as the Little White House. I mean, he consults her on every major decision that he ever makes. I mean, she she's extraordinary in her own right. When she travels to England, she has an audience with Queen Victoria, and she plays a key role in back-channeling diplomatic information from the UK to the US in what will become the most consequential century in the relationship between those two countries. You know, so, she was amazing in her own right, but you know, to Theodore was undoubtedly her most his most uh, key political strategic advisor. I mean, I, I say in the loves of Theodore Roosevelt that Bammy is to Theodore Roosevelt what Robert F. Kennedy was to John F. Kennedy. Yeah, that's a great analogy, and I think we are we are. I think anyone who who reads and writes about the Roosevelts. We're, we're kind of waiting for that Anna Roosevelt biography as well. Stand alone, just her, because she also has an incredible amount of letters that she wrote, some really descriptive and vibrant, and, and TR writes to her in the same way. So it's a, it's a wonderful relationship. But it couldn't be any more different than the younger sister, Corrine, who, if, if Anna is this strong and like, you know, can take any pain and she'll, you know, bear any burden, Corrine is not. She's described as uh, syrupy sweet. And, and well, you you describe her in your own words for us, Ed. Well, I think you've got it. I mean, I, and again, let's use Eleanor Roosevelt's descriptions of her aunts. She said, you know, if you went you went to Bammy for advice, you went to Connie for sympathy or empathy. And that's so quintessentially. You know, Connie is a poet. Uh, she She's a writer. She feels emotionally and emotively. She's more you know, emotional and impulsive, just like her brother Theodore. Uh, I think that when you know when when Theodore wanted to ha commiserate with someone, he would go to Connie. But that's not to say that Connie was not consequential in terms of her political advice as well. I mean, she was the one who would sit in on meetings when Theodore was governor of New York. And the bosses would be there and say, Boss Platt would say, all right, now, you know, after breakfast, everyone clear out. I need my time with the governor. And they would take advantage of the misogyny of the age. They say, well, surely, Connie, my, my sister, I mean, what, what harm would it be to have a woman in the room? And she would sit in on the meeting, hear everything that they discussed, such that when he concluded his term as governor, he said, Theodore said to Connie, haven't we had fun being governor of New York. I mean, it's, you know, it's extraordinary. Think about that. Bammy, in the words of his daughter, could have been president were she a man. And Connie, his other sister, was basically co-governor in his in Theodore's own assessment. That's, uh, you know, she she really, you know, if Bammy again is RFK to JFK, Connie is his press secretary before the role ever existed. She's the one who will slip stories to the press of that rambunctious home life in the White House over Edith, his wife's objections. You know, she wanted to maintain some sense of privacy and normalcy, particularly for the children. But Connie knew instinctively that if people fell in love, if the public loved the Roosevelt family, he was going to have more political success. So, you know, interesting, like most families, these siblings play very different roles uh, for one another. And that's really what I love most about the book is that what we get is a very human depiction of Theodore Roosevelt and his family, because most families are like this. You know, you don't not not everyone, uh, you know, has the same ideas and, and fighting is a normal part of a family. And we also have a great question here, uh, which is not necessarily on the topic of your book, but uh, I think is a good one to round out the family before we move on to the romantic loves of TR's life. And it says, Theodore and Elliot were born just two years apart. Theodore becomes president. Elliot dies an alcoholic and an opium addict. Yet they both had the same mother and sisters. Is there any explanation? 
Well, I mean, you know, what's also interesting about that is Elliot, as a young man, was seen as the more attractive and virile, the, the I wouldn't say successful, but more sociable. I mean, undoubtedly, the, the more attractive personality. I mean, I'm fascinated by the brothers Roosevelt Theodore. Uh, I think he had what I call psychological mirrors throughout his life. Henry Davis Minot, his his you know best friend in the early years of Harvard, was one of those mirrors. Somebody he saw as he admired and liked, but but didn't want to be like. He wanted to be stronger than or 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 better than in some way. And I think the relationship was the same with Eliot. You know, the Theodore we know from Mount Rushmore is not the Theodore that of childhood and college, right? He was a a geeky naturalist, a taxidermist. I mean, he he was more interested in arsenic than alcohol in college. Uh, you know, he smelled of formaldehyde and had uh, specimens in various stages of decay. Uh, you know, the fact that he won Alice Hathaway Lee, which we will talk about in a moment, is is almost miraculous. Elliot is swaggering and confident and uh, good looking and very, again, sociable. So I, you know, I think, Theodore had this immense capacity and intelligence. He had a self-discipline. Uh, I don't know that there was a difference in how they were raised or treated in their expectations. I do think Theodore loomed very large in the family's imagination. I think that Thee expected his eldest son to really be uh, the patriarch of the family, so probably got more, more expectations put upon him, where as Elliot really... In a way, Eliot lived the more typical life of a privileged Victorian of the era. I mean, you, this Mike, now I'm treading into your area of expertise, but you know, it, it, Theodore was unusual. You know, he he the 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 go to run for office at that time to get into politics was very unusual for a family of this wealth and influence. What Eliot did, being a hunter and and uh, a socialite, was actually more common. It just had, in, in his case, disastrous uh, results. It did. I mean, it's a, it's a terribly sad story, really. I think there's be, always been speculation that Elliot had epilepsy or some illness because they didn't send him to college like they had sent Theodore. So instead, he gets the hunting trips and and that sort of uh, life. It, but it, you're, you're right. It was a very different life. And again, I think speaks to the truth of most families that um, you know, addiction is 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 real, and you know there's, there's huge differences. So, and if he did indeed have epilepsy, which seems almost certain, yet he was self medicating, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, what he's describing, what he writes about, and what we get from the observations from the siblings certainly seems like ep epilepsy. And you know, he's having seizures, he's having, and then he's he's trying to control that with alcohol and and. Uh, and drugs and and yeah. obviously disastrous results. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, well, so far we've talked about family love, but um, there are two women in Theodore's life that are, um, well, as you say, consequential. And, and writing Alice Hathaway Lee into this story is is big because she's been overlooked. I suspect that most, most people don't know that Theodore Roosevelt was married twice. And so the first wife is kind of written off, but he meets her in Harvard. And if you could tell us the, the love story and how does he win her heart unexpectedly? Well, I mean, we're talking to, uh, good, I saw this Gail from Massachusetts. So we can talk about the Boston toast. And this is good old Boston, the home of the bean and the cod, where the Lowell's talk only to the Cabots and the Cabots talk only to God. <laughs> Alice Hathaway Lee's father was a Cabot. I mean, that is the echelon of society from which she descended. She was a Boston Brahmin, a progressive, reform-minded family, arguably the most eligible bachelorette in all of Boston. And again, Theodore Roosevelt in college, his contemporaries, his fellow college classmates describe him as eccentric, half crazy, strange, you know, so he, the idea that Theodore Roosevelt was pursuing the most eligible bachelorette in Boston was almost comical, uh, absurd. But yet he's Theodore Roosevelt. There's an intelligence there. There's a fierceness. There's a determination, something that Alice sees in him that really only a few others see. At, you know, Theodore talks over everything in his own words with, with Alice, from politics to poetry. 
uh, there were 24 letters that were unavailable to Edmund Morris and David McCullough when they wrote their seminal works, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt and Mornings on Horseback in the late 1970s, early 1980s, that were fortunately available to me and, and others uh, since uh, to write in the loves of Theodore Roosevelt. So these love letters really give you a sense of the closeness of their relationship. I mean, Alice's nickname was Sunshine. And she, so vibrant and energetic, effervescent was her personality that she was the sunshine of Theodore Roosevelt's life. She was uh, much more willing, and she comes from this progressive family. I mean, in 1880, as Sandy said in the introduction, Theodore Roosevelt writes of equality for women. He uh, endorses suffrage 40 years before the 19th Amendment. He says that women should be doctors and lawyers and judges. They should own property and not necessarily take their husband's name upon marriage. That's the influence of Alice and the Lee family. That's the influence of those Boston Brahmins. You know, and he's a Knickerbocker. To this day, Boston and New York don't always mix. I mean, the, again, this, the fact that they came together in this extraordinary way really also took family. I mean, it was... It, it, Theodore did not necessarily win Alice alone. He relied on his mother and his sisters who made a trip to Chestnut Hill and then the Lees made a trip to New York. And I contend in the loves of Theodore Roosevelt that Alice fell in love with the sisters and his mother as much as she did Theodore. She wanted to be a part of that extraordinary family and, and would do so in marrying T.R. And so th that makes it even more traumatic and sad the, the how the story ends because uh theodore roosevelt was well i mean the the famous story that almost everyone leads with when they know about theodore roosevelt's life is that on february 14th valentine's day 1883 his wife and his mother die on the same day hours apart from one another uh and his daughter his first daughter is born so what what does this do to theodore roosevelt how does it shape his life not just the trauma, but the birth of his first daughter, another love, I think, of his life. And uh, and what does that do to shape the rest of his his life? Well, let's just back up and tell the brief story, right? February 11th, he leaves for Albany uh, somewhat inexplicably. He's a bit of a, a you know a providential numerologist. He, he believes that he, the baby will be born on February 14th, 1880, because that is four years to 1884, because that is four years to the day the, of they announced their public engagement. So not unusual for him, uh, for the for the husband to be away during the birth of a child at this era, but he's in Albany. He gets that first telegram that says the baby has been born and Alice is only fair, fairly well. Then he receives a second telegram. Now, the contents of that telegram have been lost to history, but we know his reaction from his fellow state legislators. He went ashen white, ran from the New York State Assembly, took a torturous five and a half hour train ride back to New York City because the fog was so thick, the New York Times wrote a story that said the weather was suicidal. That was, you couldn't see more than a couple of inches in front of your face. So he had to walk or run from Grand Central Station to 6 West 57th Street in what is now Midtown Manhattan. And it was there that his brother had said, there is a curse on this house. Alice is dying and mother is dying too. Runs up to the third floor of the home, holds Alice until 1.30 in, in the morning when he's called down to, uh, to the second floor where Mitty, his mother, the family is gathered around her deathbed and she succumbs to typhoid fever. Then back up to the third floor, holding Alice for 11 hours until the afternoon of Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1884, she too dies. And, and one of the things I've revealed in the loves of Theodore Roosevelt for the first time is that not only did he write that X in his diary, the light has gone out of my life. Remember her nickname was Sunshine. So this is both literal and symbolic that the light has gone out of his life, that, he, that Theodore cut a large swath of Alice's hair and kept it hidden in a box for the rest of his life from Edith. He, he wrote a note that went along with that, that, that sample of her hair that said, the, the hair of my sweet wife, Alice, cut after death. So far from expunging her from his memory, he quite literally kept 
a keepsake, a macabre as it might have been, with pictures and um, uh, her hair for the rest of his life. I mean, you know, it devastated him. It absolutely devastated him. It, it really, um, it, it, this is where Bammy steps in. TR goes to the West, to the Badlands, lives a life of a rancher and a cowboy for the better part of two years. Bammy takes care of Alice, the, the, the baby. Bammy is the one who sells 6 West 57th Street. Bammy is the one who oversees the construction of what is then Lee Holm and will become Sagamore Hill. So once again, it is Bammy who is stepping in and making sure, as, as, as in Theodore's own words, the feminine atlas on which the whole world seems to rest. And it is love that will bring Theodore back from the Badlands as he fatefully re-encounters Edith, his childhood friend. Before we move on to Edith, who is such a huge personality, I do want to spend a bit of time delving into her life and her, her importance for TR and also for the nation. But um, when we go back to Alice, the understanding that we had, I, I think, in a previous era of, of history was that TR wrote her out of his life and that when she died, that he never spoke about her and he would never talk to his daughter, Alice uh, Roosevelt Longworth later, uh, we never talked to her about her mother. You say that's not true. It's not true. It's demonstrably not true. I mean, not only do we have now 24 love letters between Alice and Theodore that were kept by the family, uh, that we have this keepsake of her death um, in, in the hair that I just discussed. Uh, we also have the just simple fact that he was interacting with his in-laws for the rest of, of their life. I mean, they attend the wedding at the White House when Alice Roosevelt Longworth is married. Uh, you know, they 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 are moving Alice back and forth to Boston and, and uh, Chestnut Hill. The the Lees are paying for quite a lot of of Alice's expenses. I mean, now I think the dynamic with her stepmother was profoundly difficult. And I think that that Theodore certainly did not want to openly discuss his first wife with his daughter. And that was a psychic scar that has been carried through the generations to this day. I mean, remarkably, the granddaughter of Alice Hathaway, excuse me, the granddaughter of Alice Roosevelt Longworth is alive and well in Washington, DC. She was raised by her grandmother from age 10 onward. They lived together in her home in Washington, DC for almost 25 years. So the fact, despite the fact that Alice was the first born in 1884 and the last to die in 1980, we have a relative who I'm, whom I interviewed a half a dozen times uh, for the loves of Theodore Roosevelt. And you really can feel that intergenerational trauma of, of abandonment. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt abandoned his baby after the death of his wife. He needed to go recover in nature. He needed to have that time. Bammy understood that, but it certainly uh, resonated very deeply for for the, the child who knew that she was essentially offered to be given up. I mean, Theodore offered Bammy the opportunity to continue to raise Alice and Edith objected saying, no, no, we're gonna bring Alice back into our home and we'll raise her as our own. Okay, so we, we absolutely have to move on to Edith now. Okay. Where, there, you know, she is, uh, let me start by saying, Theodore Roosevelt never expected to marry again. That's a Victorian era American tradition. It's actually not unusual around the world. Widowers were, I wouldn't say pressured necessarily, but there was a sort of expectation that, you know, it, it was uncouth to marry again, although plenty of people did it. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt had that high-minded ethic that he wasn't going to marry again. And yet within a few years, he is married again. They do elope. Uh, they go to London and they get married in London and it's, it's they don't bring any family with them, but they do get married. So how does that play out? How does that courtship work? You couldn't really imagine two more opposite women on the face of the earth than Alice Hathaway Lee and Edith Kermit Corot. I mean, Edith is taciturn, reserved. Um, her, her stepdaughter describes her as, as almost like parchment, uh, detached. Um, more analytical and judgmental in ways that will be positive for, for Theodore because she's a much better judge of character, um, but, but really diametrically opposite. They grew up together. They were homeschooled together. Uh, Edith knew Theodore from age 
three all the way to his death. So 57 years of his 60 years, they knew one another. Uh, Edith had a hard childhood, right? She was, she, as the Carros were descending, the Roosevelt's were ascending. Her father took over the, the family business far too young. He was unprepared for it. He was an alcoholic. He had a, an accident that, that made things worse. Uh, you know, Edith writes about having to hide her childhood toys when the Roosevelt's would come over. And a lot of the poetry that I write about in The Loves of Theodore Roosevelt, you know, it's, it's, it's about sorrow. It's about loss. It's about, uh, you know, not having opportunities in her life. Everyone expects Theodore and Edith to get married. When she turns 17 in 1878, they pick water lilies, they go on a uh, walk together up the oddly named Tranquility because it's anything but tranquil when the, the Roosevelt's are there and they have a blowout fight. They split and history doesn't know exactly why. They'll only say a few things about it and basically take the secret to their grave Theodore will say to Bammy, I suppose we had and have tempers far from being the best. And Edith will simply say that Theodore had not been nice. Later, she'll claim he proposed and she rejected him. Maybe that happened, but it also, I mean, as you know better than me, Mike, knowing this era, that was common. I mean, you, you would propose more than once and demure, the woman would demure and not, and not accept the proposal on the first time. So that doesn't really explain why they split. And then somehow, you know, through fate, Alice dies at 22 and Theodore Roosevelt's first love becomes his second wife and Edith re-enters the picture and it changes everything for him. He knows that he doesn't necessarily want to see her when he comes back from the Badlands because if he does, the old love will spark again and they'll inevitably be together. And that, that's exactly what happens. I mean, they only, they only encounter each other for about six weeks and then they're engaged secretly until they get married at the end of 1886. So there's a great question from the audience here, and I want to kind of weave in a little bit of context here. So you pointed out that Theodore Roosevelt knew Edith from childhood, and that means that Bammy and Kareen also knew Edith from childhood. And the, this wonderful question's come in, did Bammy and Kareen like Edith? Did they want Theodore Roosevelt to marry her after the death of Alice? I love this question. Yes and no. Uh, they, you know, it was, so I'm, I talked about Edith's circumstances growing up, right? She's on the outside of the inner circle. She is not one of the Roosevelt's. And imagine how hard that must have been. She was very good friends with Connie. They were basically the same age. So that's how she comes into, and again, this is Mitty at work. The mother recognizing that Theodore is a little bit odd and awkward, would need some friends, and Edith is, is the perfect kind of complement to the Roosevelt children. But she doesn't get to go on the European tours. She doesn't get to have this lovely family that you know works together and is together. You know, her life is very different. And so she goes from the outside to the inside, right? To the most important for, person in the family, to being Theodore's wife. And, you know, Bammy's a little bit uncomfortable with this. She doesn't love the idea of Edith as his wife because Bammy wants to be the most important person in Theodore's life and, and his most important political advisor. You know, Connie, they have an interesting dynamic because they're friends, but now again, Edith is more important than her because she's, the, Edith is the wife. And, and so they ebb and they flow in their relationship to one another. I mean, Edith... Well, let's put it this way. Alice was the one who, when Theodore would come home from the day, would open the door and say, Teddy is home. Come and share him, right? Come and be a part of the life that we're building together. Edith would be the one to say, you know, I think we've seen enough of Connie and Douglas now for the summer, and they can stay away for a bit longer. So very, very different in terms of their approach to the family. So that's a great question, because I think that was definitely a part of the dynamic as would happen in any family, there's a push and a pull between the sisters and the wife uh, in terms of their relative to positions. Yeah, no, that's a wonderful question. I remember reading about that. At the, uh, Edith saying to uh, TR, I think we've seen enough of uh, your sisters for a little while, you know, as in, yeah, uh, sure. every family has that as well. 
exactly. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, uh, so when TR marries uh, Edith, um, obviously they they they're not thrust in the into the political life. TR has a, a bunch of um, political positions, but none of them that rise to the sort of fame as governor, vice president, and president. So how does Edith help him become the politician that he will become? Well, Bammy writes this absolutely fascinating letter to Edith upon hearing of the engagement in which she essentially says, it's so good to see Theodore back the way that he was engaged in public life and feeling uh, that, he, that he is fulfilling a larger purpose. In other words, Bammy, you know, to the prior question is basically telling Edith, you are going to have to share Theodore with the world. Politics right. needs to be a part of his life. For Edith, I think she could have taken her left politics. You know, when she leaves the White House, she says, quote, I am so glad it is all over. You know, that's not to say that she's not influential or supportive. She just doesn't need the limelight. In fact, she doesn't like the limelight. Uh, you know, a, na a Washington neighbor will observe of Edith that as, you know, she's the one that as the camera is set and it comes into focus, as you're about to click the shutter, she moves out of view. You can't quite get a, a read on, on her uh, because she, for her, the family was the all important continuum of her life, not this public adoration or sharing TR with the world. So she's reluctant, but she understands this is his larger purpose. I do say after Alice died and Edith comes back into the picture, Theodore Roosevelt does not hold elected office for 15 years. He only lives to age 60. You know, that's that's a quarter of his life. So she'll go along with this, but she's not going to necessarily be the the one championing uh, public office. That's really going to be Bammy and Connie who continue to push him up the political ladder. Absolutely. And, and, and yet when it comes to politics, I mean, many people know that Theodore Roosevelt has been called the first modern president for a lot of reasons, mainly for his engagement with the public uh, through you know media and uh, and journalists, but but also for his uh, belief that America needs to play a leading part in the world and that the presidency, the office of the presidency, is really an office that can do more with unenumerated powers, powers beyond those written in the Constitution. And Edith thinks that too. Yes, and you allude, you alluded to this, right? You called her the first modern first lady. Why do you call her that? Well, I think that the sisters and Edith opened the door to the American century and pushed Theodore through it. I mean, he he had the instincts and the personality, but not the discipline or the judgment to really uh, accomplish all that he could. But with his sisters and his wife, he could go further. And so, you know, concrete examples of that. Again, Bammy's home is the little White House. He's talking about every strategic decision he makes. There's letter after letter during the anthracite coal strike. There's conversation between uh, Bammy and Theodore about the intervention in in that coal strike. Um, there's talk about the, the you know the antitrust suit. They're they're talking strategy together and political strategy. Edith, you know, let's just start with the physical. Right. So she is the first to have a personal secretary, uh, something that every single successor first lady will follow. She entertains over 40,000 guests the first year in her White House, in, in the first year in the White House. She starts the White House China collection. She starts the first lady's portraits. She hires McKim, Mead and White at Bammy's suggestion to redesign the White House. And her husband is 42 years old. She has six children, three of whom are often with her in the White House. She wants this to be a residence, as well as the stately example of the executive of the nation. And there's very practical things, right? The Roosevelts will say, we're not going to call it the executive mansion. We want stationery that calls this the White House. You know, she'll build a colonial garden that's the predecessor for the Rose Garden. She will design what eventually becomes the East Wing and the West Wing. She'll put her office right next to Theodore's in the private residence of the White House. So. Edith is in the room where it happened because she designed it that way. And then there's the, the political, the policy, right? She reads four or five newspapers a day and she's the first person to brief the president in the morning. She's the last person to talk to him at night. She's universally regarded as a better judge of character. Franklin Delano Roosevelt says of Edith, his aunt, 
that she managed Theodore very cleverly without his being conscious of it. No slight achievement anyone will concede. And person after person, I mean, Henry Stimson, who will you know, go on to serve multiple administrations, recently enjoyed another burst of popularity or interest with the, uh, the movie Oppenheimer, uh, in which he's the secretary who, who you know, strikes Kyoto from the list of the atomic bomb. She says of Edith that every judgment the president made with Edith's guidance was better. And, and Theodore himself will say, whenever I go against Edith's judgment, I regret it. You know, so, so she plays just an enormously important role in his success. But again, she's not attached to the public and political life. When Theodore makes a decision to run, well, the two, let's, when, when did he not take her advice? He did not consult Bammy and Edith when he made the most fateful political decision of his life on his election night in 1904, declaring publicly that he would not stand for re-election in 1908, thus making himself a lame duck, even though constitutionally he could have run again. And in 1912, when he decided to run for the presidency again and, and oppose his chosen successor, Taft, it was Edith, the only person to level with him and tell him the truth. She said, put it out of your mind, Theodore. You will never be president of the United States again. And, Ouch. But she was right. She was right. Politically, strategically, she could she see the chessboard better than him. So I love that. And I think that's true. I'd still rather hang out with TR than Edith. I find her personality to be kind of so boring and... Um, well, and let's, Mike, let's talk about like that relative to Alice, right? So you talked about the, yes. the question came early. So just briefly, you know, she says some tough stuff about Alice, right? She says to her stepdaughter that had her mother lived, she would have bored Theodore to death. Right. On the day of her marriage, she says to Alice, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm so tired of you. You, I'm glad that you're leaving the house. And Alice treats this with, you know, with wit and and witty. I mean, w wisdom. I mean, Alice could give as good as she got, right? I mean, it is, of course, of Alice that Theodore will say, I can either run the country or I can control Alice, but I cannot possibly do both. And, you know, Alice has got a snake, Emily Spinach, because she doesn't like her aunt Emily and she doesn't like spinach. So obviously this, the snake is Emily Spinach. And she will be the one to say of her father, he's the bride at every wedding, the corpse at every funeral, and the baby at every christening, right? So she could give as good as she got. And that, that relationship with Edith was, was probably more the source of tension around Alice, because as Alice later said, I don't think my stepmother ever forgave my father for his first marriage, you know, forever in Theodore's mind, his first wife would loom a as a 22-year-old. And, and that was probably very hard for Edith to, to uh, outlive and overcome. Well, that's great. That's a great segue to two decisions that have come up in the questions here. So Elizabeth Barber asks, did your research include the fact that the senior, that Theodore Roosevelt senior, objected to the potential engagement of Theodore to Edith prior to going to Harvard to which uh, David McCullough refers to in Mornings on Horseback. And just on that, too, about decisions that Edith was a part of, her lack of support for TR's run for mayor in 1894 is Robert uh, Tigert's um, question. I love, well, I love these questions because these we, we've got true TED heads with us. They know the story. Um, Yes, I do talk in the loves of Theodore Roosevelt about the possibility that the had objected because of the state of the Carros to a marriage uh, with Edith. That's, of course, something that Sylvia Jukes Morris in her phenomenal single volume biography, there should be more biographies of Edith, uh, and we'd know even more. What's tricky about that is, is that it was all retro perspective. You know, it, we don't have any contemporary evidence. We don't have any historical evidence of those conversations. We, we have people later in life, often in the oral interviews that, that Michael has done such a good job preserving and remembering Theodore Roosevelt and elsewhere, that, that they're looking back or they're speculating on the reasons and, uh, that they didn't get married. 
Um, so we we don't really know. I, I would love for the loves of Theodore Roosevelt to be adapted so a fiction writer can take some liberties and maybe surmise what happened. I've got my own pet theories, but I do too. I have my well, own. We got to compare notes on these. We, we do. We have to. We need to. We need to. And then the second, um, the 1894 race. Well, you know, she was right. I mean, again, Edith was right. If Theodore Roosevelt had run for mayor of New York City in 1894, he probably would have won, and we wouldn't be talking about him today. No mayor of New York City has ever gone on to win the presidency. Uh, it is a very difficult position from which to maneuver then and now. Uh, I don't entire. I can't say with entire confidence that that's why Edith uh, made that decision or gave that direction. She had financial reasons for doing so. She had also, you know, she had had five children in 15 years and two miscarriages. She had moved five times from New York to Washington and then a, a move to Albany as well. You know, there were practical considerations that she took into account that he didn't, but she also happened to be right politically. And he was furious. I mean, he was very upset that she basically forbade him from running in 1894. And she, she retreated after that and sort of said, well, you know, then fine, you make your, your political decisions because I'm not gonna be the one that gets blamed uh, for you not fulfilling the life that you imagined. But, but had he run, he probably would have won. And I don't know that he becomes president after that. Well, and I think, you know, there was other, later on in 1898, for example, I don't think she was too enthusiastic about him going to Spain or going to Cuba, I should say, in the Spanish-American War. And maybe maybe that's a great turning point for when she decides, well, either I'm going to live with Theodore Roosevelt's the decisions or I'm going to have to butt heads with them and, you know, maybe have a falling well, out. St Stacey Cordery is wonderful on this. You know, yeah. she wrote a, a, I, I quote in the Loves of Theodore Roosevelt, Stacey's, she's, she wrote the single volume biography of Alice Roosevelt Longworth, has done a lot of writing for the Theodore Roosevelt Association. Yep. And she has a really good take on that where, so Edith uh, is, she she suffers a very difficult birth in Quinton and then has to have a an operation shortly after uh, that is, is truly life-threatening. And later Theodore Roosevelt will say, I would have left my wife's deathbed to be in Cuba. Well, I mean, it was retrospective, but but cruel nonetheless, okay. because it was almost literal. I mean, she she was on, uh, she was not very well. And, you know, she didn't want him to go to Cuba at first and then came around to the idea and then travels to Tampa to be with Theodore before he dispatches for Cuba. And in a way, um, Stacy surmises that was that was her uh, saying, I've not only accepted this decision, I support it. I want you to go to war knowing that I fully support this action and whatever the result might be. But the result could have very well been that she was a widow and, and you know, five children and one stepchild in her care at that point, including a baby, you know, had just been born. So it was, it was enormously risky. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I've got to really, I've got to get to this question because it's from the, uh, the wonderful historian, Natalie Naylor, who, you know, for people that don't know uh, uh, Dr. Naylor, uh, she is a, women's studies and gender historian who's written extensively about Theodore Roosevelt with the likes of John Gable and Douglas Brinkley. And uh, she's really a wonderful scholar. She's got a great question. One that in fact, I was going to ask you. So I'm going to try and merge these two together. She says, any words about Ethel Roosevelt Darby? And my question to you is very similar. If you had to expand the book, uh, you can leave out a long groan here if you want to, but if you had to expand the book and include more women, who would they be? Would you include the, the daughters, would you include Jane Addams maybe, or Edith Wharton, or maybe another choice? I, I mean, you've named Jane Addams, Edith Wharton, uh, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, Eleanor Roosevelt. I mm. mean, we, and we really just get to touch upon Eleanor here. And Ethel, I mean, Ethel, probably the most underappreciated of the Roosevelt children. I mean, you know, quietly and confidently preserving the legacy of her father, serving on the board of the American Museum of Natural History, uh, overseeing that process of it becoming the, the New York State Memorial to TR. I mean, that that's the other, you know, and I, I thank you so much for the, the question and for your incredible um, work. Uh, you know, Theodore Roosevelt listened to women. 
he, it's not just his family. He respected the opinions of women. In If you had an argument with facts and information on your side, as certainly Jane Addams or Susan B. Anthony took an audience with Susan B. Anthony. I mean, that's not to say Theodore Roosevelt was perfect. He did not fight as hard as he could have when he had the power to do so for, for things like suffrage. And then, of course, in 1912, would become the first party platform to endorse suffrage, but he, he didn't have the power to make the change that he could have more vocally um, supported when he when he was in the White House. But yeah, if I if I had the, I mean, there's a whole other volume to be written. Uh, it was enough to try to focus on these five women, but I think that, you know, Ethel and Alice and Eleanor, uh, and then all of these incredible women who are in his life and corresponding with the president very regularly would, would make another whole volume. Absolutely. I just want to point out what uh, Jerry uh, Carboni has pointed out here is that Ethel has links to Brattleboro, Vermont. Uh, her daughter marries uh, uh, Senator Gannett, uh, Robert Gannett. Uh, so there's that connection there. And I, I want to push you a little bit on the suffrage movement. We don't have a lot of time left, but I, I think this is a good way to kind of think about Theodore Roosevelt and his relationship with women and also the idea of women's rights. And it was actually Natalie Naylor, who made me think of this, but it was Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the great American suffragette, uh, who she wrote to Theodore Roosevelt, I think days before his death. I could be wrong, but it's 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 near her own passing. And she says something like, you know, please help women get the right to vote. You will become immortal. And I think she's right about that in a sense. If he had worked harder to do that, and my sense has always been that there's been a Theodore Roosevelt out of power and out of office that is more radical and progressive than the Theodore Roosevelt that is in power. And I'm just wondering, what do you think about that? Well, I think, well, first of all, thank you again to Natalie Naylor for her incredible work on this subject. And I would point out another um, incredible historian, uh, Dr. Kathleen Dalton. I mean, Dr. Kathleen Dalton, for my money, the big, the best single volume biography of Theodore Roosevelt, A Strenuous Life, published in 2001, you know, Kathy and I had this extraordinary conversation in which I uh, recount in the preface to the loves of Theodore Roosevelt, where I asked her, why weren't people willing to understand Theodore Roosevelt in this way? And without hesitation, Kathy answered, time. People were not ready to understand Theodore Roosevelt as anything but the product of his own will. And we, we are all of us, if we are fortunate, the product of our, our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, a colleague, a friend, somebody who picks us up and pushes us forward, who propels us when we fall or falter. And I think, you know, Dr. Dalton's work in, two th in that book really show a more progressive Theodore Roosevelt. I think as he, he voluntarily gave up power, the worst, the, the worst political decision he ever made in his life, and then he knew it. He knew he wanted to get back in. I mean, you know, he says to Felix Frankfurter that the country will not be complete until we have a black and a Jewish president. Now, the last speech that Theodore Roosevelt ever gives in his life, November 2nd, 1918, is to a mixed race audience at Carnegie Hall, W.E.B. Du Bois on stage. He is giving a full-throated endorsement of equal rights between black and white such that had he been elected in 1920, which of course will not come to pass because he'll die in 1919, he might have stuck a stake in the heart of Jim Crow 45 years before the Civil Rights Act. I mean, he made a lot of mistakes and then we can appreciate what he didn't do and how he could have done better. But this arc of his life bends towards justice in a very progressive way that, that Dalton makes a case for. And I think you know, you're exactly right, Mike. When he was out of power, he he had he saw that he could have done more in the fight for the people. He could have done more on suffrage. He could have done more on equality. He could have done more in labor. You know, he could have done more in conservation. Even he th thought he could have done more on something he's un undoubtedly known for and championed. Um, so it's it's a fascinating arc in that life, and it's fascinating also to see. Someone like Alice Roosevelt Longworth comes back into the picture. She supports the 1912 run. You know, Edith even reluctantly comes around on, on that run. You know, and it's Bammy and, 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 and Connie who are sort of seeing him out of power is not a good look. I mean, he's, he needs to have 
um, an influence and a, and, a, and a pulpit from which he can not just preach, but actually put action into place. Yeah, I think that's a great way to sum up the importance of women, too. I mean, they are really they are pushing him to do those things. And whether it's Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, as we mentioned, or whether it's family members and wives. And so this is what makes your book so important, Ed. And I'm so delighted that you came on to talk to us about it tonight. I would encourage everyone, if they get an opportunity uh, to go to a good bookseller online or in, ideally somewhere in Brattleboro, surely. Uh, Sandy might be able to tell us where these books are in stock, but please do pick them up because I think this book has made a big splash in how we think about Theodore Roosevelt and indeed the whole period of this late 19th and early 20th century. Thanks, Ed. Well, thank you so much, Mike. I deeply appreciate all the work and scholarship you are contributing to Theodore Roosevelt. I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of Kathy and Stacy and Betty and Mike and, um, all the wonderful folks who have, uh, Natalie, uh, who've written so much more on this subject. And so I just appreciate that we're able to bring these stories of these incredible women out into the light, into public view with more appreciation. So thank you. Thank you, Edward and Michael, for this, so, such an illuminating conversation on President Roosevelt and the women in his life. And please order the book. It's um, There's a link in the chat, which supports all indie bookstores because it's too... Um, books.com, which gives a portion of the sales to indie bookstores. And we have several indie bookstores in the area, which probably have a copy of it in stock. The Byway Books and Everyone's Books. So, um, next, our next cocktail hour will be Friday, June 21st at 5.30 with Thomas Ricks, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist was the author of five best-selling books, and including a number one bestseller, Fiasco. Oh, yeah. He's a finalist, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. His new book is a complete change of direction. He's now retired, and he's writing a mystery book. Everyone knows but you. The perfect summer read. So until then, be safe, be well, and enjoy the summer. Thank Thanks, you very everyone. Much. Bye.